Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over this weekend's UFC card, UFC Fight Night at the Apex in Las Vegas. And unfortunately, it's been reduced to a 12-fight card. But the good news is, is these 12 fights do carry uh, quite a bit of upside. So you are going to be able to build some kind of high-scoring lineups. And it's a question of how different you want to get um, to try to take down the big one. You know, because on a 12-fight card, it does become different to get, it does, it does become difficult to get unique. Um, the only ways to really get unique on 12 fight cards are either just, just essentially playing the fights that do not rate to score the most, but hope to be on the right side of, you know, a variance or um, by kind of fun, funny construction where maybe you like leave money on the table or things like that. Um, so the, the other thing I'd like to mention before we get into this card is, kind of the construct or the context of the slate or the construct of the slate. When you have 12 fights, um, you always try, you have to figure out what types of underdogs you really need to, to be targeting. There are some cards where, you know, say it's a 15 fight card. Typically you're going to be very demanding of your, of your plays. You know, it's not good enough to say, well, I think this, you know, this, this uh, girl or guy's got about a, you know, a uh, 30% chance to win. So it's 7,200. I'll go ahead and I'll play my win equity or something like that. No, on a 15 fight card, you actually need to ha have more than just the win. You need to win with a lot of points. Whereas if you had say, for example, like an eight, eight fight card or something like that, believe me, if you get six wins, that's going to be good enough for you. Uh, it may be, you won't even need six. Um, so the, the, the more, the, the, the bigger the card is, the more likely you'll need high scoring from your underdogs. And, and honestly, uh, it, even within that, it's somewhat slate dependent, uh, slate dependent because if you have a, a, what rates to be a high scoring slate in general, you know, then you're going to need to have high scores from your, from your winners. And that's it. So it's not just there are only 12 fights. It's what those other fights just kind of look like. So what we're going to do is I'm not going to say we're going to do it differently, but we're going to go through the plays and then we're going to like think about it in terms of constructing for a, you know, for, for the big buy-ins, excuse me, for the, uh, for the lottery type buy-ins, because you're talking about two different things, right? I can tell you what the good plays are, but exactly how to construct those to win the hundred thousand, for example, is very difficult. Like last week, I mean, it was very, very clear. I mean, I went through this at length that, that, um, that the Gomes play was extremely strong. You know, Gomes was a, that would have all kinds of line equity and she had, she had takedown upside and she smashed and Kutalaba had basically the highest um, inside the distance prop on the slate plus takedown upside. And he was only 8,500 or so. So those two plays were just really strong, but, but he ended up also, and ended up also playing Billy Quarantillo who he didn't get there. So well, he lost actually. So even though I, mean, I did have a Barbosa uh, as, as one of those, you know, kind of key fighters you want to target, as an underdog, you know, you got to get the right combinations. And if you're playing the same types of things everybody's playing, it, uh, you run into, into duplication issues and all kinds of stuff. So we are going to go through these plays, but we're then also going to try to figure out which of these plays we can really use in a GPP. Because again, with 12 fights, there are not as many combinations as some of the bigger cards. So you want to make lineups that hopefully avoid getting duped and yet still have a chance. Okay, so... Right off the bat, we have Dana Baccarel or Baccarel Denad, depending on how the announcer pronounces it, against Brady Highstand. And this is a very um, instructive fight for someone who's just starting out in DFS uh, MMA. Um, and we're going to get to that in a second. Let's just take a look at the odds. You have, I guess, minus 130 with big adjusted. So you're expecting to see Baccarel something like 80. 400 maybe maybe 84 to 7800 we always do a double check to make sure there's no huge line value and this is well i have to say that it's a uh, what you call it that it's a uh, you you are getting a little bit of line value here at Houston okay this type of gap 8700 to 7500 is usually commensurate but it's almost a 2 to 1 favorite and here because i guess money was coming in on Houston that this is you, you are getting a little bit of, of, of line value on him. The, the, the instructive part about this is that um, both fighters are good plays because both of their win conditions are very conducive to high scores. 
We're going to start with the one I'm sure about, and that's Brady Highstand. So Brady Highstand's entire path to victory in this fight is going to come from the wrestling. And as we know, or hopefully we know, wrestling tends to score very, very high. Um, now, there are issues with actually getting decisions nowadays if you're a grappler. Uh, sometimes the referees tend to favor the strikers, but that's all been kind of factored into the price here. We're, we're presuming that if he wins, right, which he's going to win about, what, 54% of the time, something like that, he's going to score, you know, pretty well for a $7,500 fighter. So it's a very, very important point. Um, now, yet on the other hand, Dana Baccarell, if he wins, he's got a much better chance to win by knockout, okay? Because if you just look at his, well, first of all, you can look at his game logs and know this, but even if you didn't, you look at his inside the distance prop and you have him inside the distance at about a plus 170, which is pretty reasonable for this, uh, for this price. It's not the greatest in the world honestly i've seen better for 8700 um but it's okay um there's no you know back around let's go back around round one so round one you're getting plus 260 or so which is which is fine you know which is fine that's pretty good for round one so that means about what 30 percent of the time he wins in round one about that actually maybe a little less um, and if he wins in round one, that's going to be you know, obviously a really, really good score. I mean, it's going to be 100 points plus. So, um, yeah, I think that both sides of this fight are certainly worth targeting. And that is not going to be no secret to anybody. I mean, we're, I'm looking at the ownership now, and this is you know not completely tight yet, but I'm seeing he stands starting off at about 24% ownership. And we have Baccarel at about 25 as well. So the public is kind of on to this. I mean, they're 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 the the they're, they're projecting that both these guys are going to be decently owned, and and you know they should be, but it's not like you're doing anything spectacular by playing these guys. But let's just start with what the great plays, good plays are, and then we'll move on. So both of these fighters are good plays. If you're splitting up your lineups, you could go, I mean, you can do whatever you want. You could play either of them. You could play both of them, but they're they're both very strong plays. Uh, moving on, you have another one. You have Kareem Silva versus Patricia. Priscilla Clachuera. And this one's a little bit confusing to me. So we will deal with this. Well, first of all, as far as the line goes, Silva's about a two to one favor, maybe a little bit less. So expect to see about 9K, uh, 7, 7,200. And that's what you're getting. Silva 9,100 versus 7,100 here. Um, now at, at 9,100, you look at the favorite first. I mean, you really need either an inside the distance prop of about $1.10, meaning probably about a coin flip that you win inside the distance or uh, have some wrestling upside. So the good thing about this is that even though her inside the distance prop is not the greatest, that is, let's take a look. Actually, inside the distance, she's plus 150. I mean, that's pretty good. You know, I thought it was going to be worse. Because you you mix in the fact that she's got takedown upside. I mean, this, I mean it's a significant takedown upside. Cachoeira has gotten taken down like several times. Um, and Silva does have good jujitsu as well. So I think she's actually a pretty strong play at 9,100, um, given the combination of her inside the distance prop and the uh, and her takedown upside. Now, on the other hand, you have Cachoeira, who, I mean, I have to say that even though her inside the distance prop is not that great, it's like plus 325. I mean, I, I know what I see. And, and, and when she comes out there, she she just gets after it. I mean, she doesn't care whether she gets hit or not. She's just going to get into a freaking brawl. And what that means that in her wins, she's just going to score really well. You know, I mean, there I know it says there the inside the distance props like plus 330 um, or, or even higher. I mean, first of all, I think it's probably a good bet. But we'll get to that in the betting breakdown. But nonetheless, even if she doesn't, you know, take her out. She's going to be putting up like all kinds of volume as well. So even in a, in a kind of a nice volume based, you know, comeback decision, she could score almost, almost a hundred, you know, maybe 90 or so. So I think she's extremely strong here as an underdog play. So uh, I, I like both sides of this fight as well. So right off the bat, you're talking about two pretty, pretty high energy fights. But the thing that's different about this one is that, I don't know, maybe I'm missing something, but 
I see Kareem Silva at 37% ownership, which is, I mean, seems a little high, honestly. I mean, it's a good play, but it's not like the greatest play in the world. Is she a better play than Dana Baccarell? I mean, I don't know, maybe. Um, but Priscilla Cachoeira, I have currently is owned at under 15%, and that to me is kind of a travesty. I mean, I'm not saying she's going to win, but if she wins, the chances that her score is optimal is so high that I just feel as though she should be owned higher. So uh, I think that she's a very, very strong um, underdog play. Probably even stronger than the um, the he stand just because of the ownership. Um, so I don't know. I, again, he stands actually probably stronger just because of his win odds. Or just he actually has some line equity. Um, remember we mentioned like he stand was only a plus one thirty favorite, uh, and he's being priced probably as a two to one underdog. Well, not two to one, maybe like nine to five. Where at least Cachoeira deserves her price from a you know line value perspective, but. I don't know. I think her upside is really strong given her chances of winning and her ownership being as low as it is. I think this is a very, very you know strong GPP play. All right. Uh, William Gomez versus Francis Marshall. We're expecting a similar type price. Yeah, 9,200, 7K. I didn't go too fast, right? And you see this, right? So, so you have Silva, Cachuera is about minus 200, and Marshall Gomez is about the same. So it should be about the same DraftKings price than it is. So we're looking for the same things out of someone like Francis Marshall. We're looking for either takedown upside or, or uh, inside the distance prop of about minus 110. Take a look, and we have his inside the distance prop is not that great. It's like plus one, plus like 200. So for him to be a really good, good play, he would have, need to have significant takedown upside. And I have not been convinced that that's the case. I mean, I've been I've been looking at some content. I've been hearing some contrary opinions and stuff. And I, I, I think I could make the case that actually Gomez could be at least close to the same type of wrestler as, as Marshall is. So I'm not exactly sure that Marshall is has that type of takedown upside. And if I'm not sure about that, and all I'm left with is the, you know, inside the distance plus 220. I mean, I would have to concede that the previous underdog, the previous favorite, Silva is just a better play. You know, the, the only thing I will say, I'm going to take a look at the ownership here. I see Marshall at th at thirty percent. Yeah, it's a little bit lower than than Silva, but still, that's a pretty healthy that's a pretty healthy bit of ownership for somebody who um who's inside the distance prop is not good, and his takedown upside is, I think. In question, I'm not saying it's it's hundred percent happening or not happening. It's certainly in question. So I don't know. I put him uh, kind of on the outside looking in as sort of the top plays here, even considering the ownership. Now, Gomez at seven k. If I knew for sure that like his wins were going to be really high scoring, I might take a shot here just because he's two only two to one underdog, but. Gomez inside the distance is probably going to really poor, if I'm not mistaken. Let's see. Gomez inside the distance is plus like 500. And I just don't see the, um, I just don't see the, uh, the, the, um, I don't see the inside the distance prop. I don't see any of it. Okay. Um, so I don't think Gomez is going to be a pretty good, uh, a good underdog. Sorry, I got distracted for a second there. But just to summarize, I think Marshall is kind of an outside looking in play. And I just don't think that Gomez quite has, has that, that, that's what I'm looking for, has that for sure win condition that if he wins, it's definitely going to be getting takedowns and stuff like that. So I think Gomez, look, in, in 150 max, I think is probably worth a stab. Uh, but uh, just anything less than, say, 40, 50 lineups, I don't, I, I really don't think he's going to get too much of them, if at all. Uh, Junior Tafa versus Muhammad Uzman. All right, so you have basically a pick em fight that's being priced as such. Gomez, uh, sorry, let's sort by fight, actually. Uzman and Tafa, 8,200, 8K. Um, so no line value there. But the thing of this fight is that you have this 8,200, 8K fight. 
that has a very, very strong inside the distance prop and some real strong scoring in the offing gear. Let's take a look at it. You have Tafa, for example, um, is a plus 160 inside the distance, you know, adjusting for big and stuff, maybe even plus 140. And at an 8K, that's an extremely, extremely strong price. Um, Usman, inside the distance. Now, he is only plus 200, but there's a kicker here in that he's got some wrestling upside. Uh, he didn't show it you know, in his last fight, but apparently in his other fights, he does have that upside to him. He can wrestle. So that makes up for the, you know, the, the, the inferior inside the distance prop. So both of these fighters are really key pieces and should be, you know, considered very, very strong plays. Seven to one are super unison. Six is second. Solomon's goal. Three is. So, uh, yeah. So let's get back to this, to this board here. So let's put in somebody from the He Stand fight. We'll put in someone from the Silva fight and we'll put in someone from the Tafa fight. I think that either of these, I really could not guess which of these are the better plays between the Tafa and Usman. Let's take a look at ownership. I can't imagine either of them are going to be that much higher than the other. I have Tafa only 21%. And then I have Usman at quote unquote only 25%. I mean, this should be kind of a key fight, you know. I guess it's being owned similarly to the to the Baccarel, um, the Baccarel P stand fight. I guess that makes some sense. I think it's very similar. I think I think whoever wins is scoring well, and I'm not exactly sure who's winning. So yeah, so I'm going to consider this fight another kind of key fight, along with the Silva Cachiera fight and the He stand uh, Baccarel fight. All right, uh, moving on, we have Norma Dumont versus Carol Hossa or Rosa. You know, basically a pick em fight, maybe slight favorite to Dumont. Uh, and she's being priced like she's about a minus 120 or minus 125. So there's no line value here. Um, so let's just take a look at the, at the, at the props here. <laughs> and then we'll look at some style issues. I don't imagine either of these fighters has a strong inside the distance prop. Yeah, you have Rosa plus one, plus 600. You have Dumont plus 700. So th there's no finishes kind of in the offing here. With respect to takedowns and wrestling, I mean, I've heard the case made that both of them are kind of weak off their back. So I guess if one of them does get a takedown, that could translate into some control time, but the chances of that is really not that high. So according to the math and according to theory, this fight is just going to be a pass. The, o the only thing I will say is that if you look at the ownership, I presume that these guys are not going to be owned. These girls are not going to be owned. Actually, look at Dumont at 19%. That's kind of healthy. But then you have Carol Hosa at 31%. I don't get that at all. I mean, are they saying that Hosas get more of an opportunity to get takedowns? Is that is that why she's getting owned more? Do they think the seventy nine hundred is that big a deal? I I would never, if I were like splitting up these two girls, unless it really just opened up different things in my lineups. There's no way I would play Rosa more than Dumont, and I probably wouldn't play either of them. The only thing I was gonna say is that it gets you leverage off of what I think should be a a highly owned range. Uh, range fight between Tafa and um, and Usman. By range fight, I mean both price ranges are the same. You have 8,200, 8K, 8,300, So you could get leverage off of that price range if you play this fight instead, but it doesn't look like you're getting a big ownership break either. So uh, I don't know. This, this fight is probably going to be a pass for me uh, unless, you know, you get down to 40, 50 lineups. So that'll be my second kind of pass -ish type fight. Um, that would be um, the Marshall fight bordering on passing, Hosa Dumont bordering on passing. Okay, Montel Jackson versus Ronnie Yaya. You have a minus 600 favorite. So they got a little smart in that they priced a minus 500 favorite, probably what they should be, and that's more like 95, 9600. But they priced them at 9700. 
So, so here's the deal. At 9,700, what you usually need. Okay, so this is what you need to play 9,700 Biden. That's important. You need to have both. Well, you need to have either. Like in, I would say inside the distance of minus 200, plus probably a minus 110 to finish inside the first round. As a matter of fact, I think that's what I would demand. Uh, minus 110 to finish inside the first round. Or, or an inside the distance prop of minus 110 plus wrestling upside. Not either or, but plus. So for a $9,700 fighter to be playable, that's that's what I would demand is either is probably first round upside, first round KO of minus 110. Now, Usman does have a little, not Usman, uh, Montel Jackson has some, another sneaky bit of upside and that is he has knockdowns, okay? Um, and knockdowns can rack up points as well. And if this fight plays out the way some people think it might, that could be an option because the one thing that Gar that uh, Yaya has going for him is he does have good submissions. So the worst thing that um, the worst thing for Jackson would be to get this fight to the ground. So if he knocks down Yaya, he might not, as most fighters would do, just kind of just try to pounce on him and, and ground and pound him, whatever. Because in that case, you you submit you know you um, submit yourself to the possibility of getting submitted. Um, where he might just knock him down, let him get back up, and then keep knocking him down. And those those types of fights are sneaky. Like they, those add up pretty quickly. Those knockdowns. They had um the um <laughs> whoever the older guy was this past weekend in Kansas City did that for his home crowd. He knocked uh, Herman down like four times. Then knocked then stopped him in the third round. Got 130 fantasy points. So um so that's what you need from a guy like that for a, a price like that. And let's just kind of take a look. So forget the forget the win by the inside the distance. It's it, well, it's minus one thirty, which is fine. But let's see first round. So Jackson first round is actually not great. I mean, it's plus one fifty or so, and so it's he's favored to not get there. The only thing is, is if in fact again that other scenario plays out where. He gets him out of there in the second round and adds in a couple of knockdowns. That'll make up for that first round. You know what I mean? So um, the other, by the way, the other way you could play that's 9,700 is if he does only rate to get 100 points, but there's enough underdogs where you can just make it work easy. Okay. Um, so you could, you can play him even though as a, in, a, uh, in a vacuum, maybe he's not the greatest play. But if you play some of these good underdogs, we talked about like maybe Cachuera or or um, what's it called a high stand, um, then you but you could probably get to him rather rather easily actually. So um, definitely in play, tough to get to, and I just gotta leave it at that. Yaya, he's just too big of an underdog. I have no interest. So Lucindo versus Brogan Walker, you have a my. You know, minus 275 or so. Oh, let's look it up here. Actually, we're going to not go to her first. We're going to go to... Actually, we will. Lucinda Walker, you have... Lucinda is like a minus 350 or something like that, or 325. So you're expecting a big price, 9,400, 9,500. Let's take a look and see what she is. Um, she is... I did skip a couple of fights. She is 9,500, which is what she's supposed to be. Now, again, for a $9,500 fighter, what we need is both. We need an inside the distance prop of minus 110, and you want some takedown upside, all right? Otherwise, you better get her out of there in the first round. And I'm pretty sure that for a women's fight, this does not have a, not for a women's fight, but as a women's fight, it probably doesn't have the greatest inside the distance prop. Let's just take a look. You have Lucindo inside the distance is plus 200. Not great. Not great. And as far as her takedown upside, I guess, you know what I mean? Like, I guess that's the best I can describe this. I, I consider her, her chances of, of, of winning by takedown and finish and stuff like very similar to, I was going to say Francis Marshall, but I don't know. Um, I think she's fine. Look, I think she's going to win, but that doesn't do anything for me. You know, if she just wins a striking based decision, 
doesn't get her out of there and she, you know, twisted, she doesn't get her out of there about 66% of the time, then that loses. Just does. I mean, how often does she, is she really gonna, gonna win a decision and get there at 9,500? I don't know. I just don't know. So uh, I think she's kind of borderline, if you want to know the truth. And unfortunately, you know, Lucindo is a plus 300 underdog, probably just not worth it. Not Lucindo. Um, Walker is, not, is a big, big underdog like that. Just doesn't have enough win equity to get there. Okay, going back to the to the order here, which was uh, Christos Yagos versus Ricky Glenn. You have Ricky Glenn, who's about a minus 140 after VIG. So it's about, I guess, about 8,700 or so. And we will take a look and we will see that, wow, Glenn is 9K. Uh, that is that is not good. That is real. That is not really good line value at all here. As a matter of fact, pretty decent line value on Yagos. You know, at plus one fifty. At plus one fifty, you should just not be seventy two hundred. So, right off the bat, Yagos is going to be a, a decent play, be a decent underdog, um, even in the absence of a lot of upside. But but even so, I think his upside sort of exists. Now, I don't think it's necessarily inside the distance prop. But let's take a look. First of all, uh, we'll look at Yagos first. Yagos by sub, well, that's by submission. Yagos inside the distance is plus 500. That's no good, but I think he's got some takedowns. And if he gets some takedowns and he's got a plus one, he's only like a plus 150. I mean, that's going to score pretty well at that price. So I think Yagos is very alive here um, on DraftKings. Uh, Ricky Glenn, again, bad, first of all, bad line value for openers. Not only that, but look at his inside the distance prop. Glenn inside the prop. Glenn inside the distance is what? Uh, Glenn inside the – where is Glenn inside the distance? Glenn by TKO is plus 500, submission plus 600. So we're probably looking at – oh, here it is, plus 300. That's just no good. It's just this is a terrible play. So, uh, in the absence of him being like five, like ten percent owned, I just have no interest. Let's take a look at the ownership just for the hell of it. Ricky Glenn, eighteen percent. That's way over owned for me. So I like uh, Chris Asiago's as an underdog for DFS here, and probably not going to get to Ricky Glenn. All right, uh, Jeremiah Wells versus Matthew Semmelsberger. You have about a pick 'em fight. So you're expecting about, you know, 8,100, 8,100, maybe a, I was going to say slight lean towards Wells, but not really. Let's take a look at the price. Actually, you're getting a little bit of line value on Semmelsberger. I mean, not through the roof, but 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 it certainly, is, you know, it's significant enough for me to notice. How about that? So, yeah, uh, as far as the lines go, definitely Semmelsberger sort of has the edge. But we'll take a look at the inside the distance prop, and I think that's where uh, Wells kind of picks up that steam so wells inside the distance is a plus 170 or so which at this price is is not bad at all you have semmelsberger inside the distance plus 300 and that's really just not great so so that's why even though so this is weird so semmelsberger is the better play for line value but wells is the better play for upside okay so Wells, I'm definitely going to have a big piece of, but the question is, do I want to play Semmelsberg? Um, probably have to have a little just because of the line value, but I definitely think Wells is a better play. So Wells, very, very strong mid-range play on this uh, on this thing. Okay, do we just really just have three left? Let's see. Uh, yeah, just three left. So we have... Bobby Green versus Jared Gordon. Yeah, you know, Bobby Green is a minus 250-ish favorite. Expect him to be about, you know, 9,100 or so, maybe a little bit higher. Boy, they made him 9,400. Wow. Well, Mr. Green, for 9,400, you know what we're going to need, right? You're going to need either an inside the distance prop of minus like 200 or first round inside the distance prop of minus, say, 110 or maybe at the at worst, plus 120. Or a lot of takedowns. Well, I promise you this, Bobby Green's not taking anybody down. So let's take a look at the inside the distance props here. You have Bobby Green inside the distance, plus 300. Oh, no. Horror show. 
So I want to look at first round. I mean, first round plus a, a thousand. By the way, I think it's probably a good bet. Well, we're going to get there. Um, the, the interesting play is Jared Gordon, if you want to know the truth. You know, J Jared Gordon, he he fought um, Patty Pimblett. And he, listen, he, he fought really, really close. It's, a lot of people thought he won that fight. But he was able to, 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 to get in the clinch and grapple a little bit, you know. And I have to say that Jared Gordon is not doesn't that, is not a great striker. So what that means is that if in fact he does win, I think it's gonna be because he gets these takedowns. Uh, again, Bobby Green is, is listen, he's a has a really good takedown defense. So the chances Gordon gets it done is very slim, but that's all factored into the price. I don't know. Like it, so what's what what does this mean? So if you're plus two two forty or so, so you win about 30% of the time. 30% of the time that his price is what? It's crazy. His price is 6,800. I'm just going to have to try it. So for me in this fight, I like the Gordon side more than green with respect to DFS. All right. Two more. Uh, Brad Tavares versus Bruno Silva. Um, I already cheated. I looked at the prices here. So let's go backwards. So if Tavares is 8,900 and Silva's 73, what should the money line be? I would say Tavares minus 190-ish, maybe 180-ish. Let's take a look. You have actually Tavares is, is only minus 140 or so, or minus 150. So there's a tiny sliver of line value actually in the Bruno Silva side. Actually, I would venture to say more than a little bit of, of, of uh, more than a sliver. I mean, at 8,900, 73, 7,300 at that price is very reasonable. So I think the line value is going with Silva here. Let's take a look at the inside the distance props. So, you know, for 8,900, you know what we need out of Tavares, right? About maybe plus 110, plus 115 inside the distance or wrestling upside, which is probably not the case here. So let's look at Brad Tavares. Let's look at this whole fight. Tavares inside the distance is plus 230. No good. Let's take a look at Sylvan's. Silva inside the distance is actually a better price than Tavares inside the distance. When I mean, you think about that, I mean, he's like a one's 9,100, or one's 8,900, the other's 7,300. This is an incredible play, I have to say. So Bruno Silva at 7,300 makes a, yet another very strong underdog play. Oh, this is going to be a fun slate. Now we move on to the main event, and this is the unfortunate reality. Um, well, we'll just go the same same thing. We have 8,800, 7,400, so we're expecting to see about you know minus 170 or so, maybe minus 180. For Blades, let's take a look. And, you know, Blades is a little bit lower. So you could say that Pavlich might have a little bit of line value. But none of this matters because you have you have two very, very strong win conditions. You know, if Pavlovich, let's take a look at Pavlich's inside the distance prop, for example. Pavlovich inside the distance is plus 170. And he's only, uh, you know, he's only 7,600, whatever. I and mean, this is like, uh, you have to play this. You just have to. I mean, almost all, not all of them, but so many of his wins just are first-round KOs in this spot. You know, as a matter of fact, let's see what, what this is. Let's see what, let's see what he is in the first round. Pavlovich round one is, it's like plus 275. Okay, plus 300. So 30% of the time he wins in round one. I actually think it's, well, I shouldn't say it's more than that because there are times that he loses. Um, so I think that of his wins, a good amount of them are round one. So at that price, you just have to have it. And then Blades, not only does he have big, a big inside the distance prop him own, his own self, you know, you look at Blades inside the distance is like basically a pick of and he's got five rounds to work with, and he's got takedown upside. I mean, this is a super smash spot. So 
Unfortunately, this is not going to be anything earth shattering and the entire United States of America and all uh, associated provinces and all associated Euro members and UN leaders, they will all be playing this fight. Uh, this will be an extremely high on fight. I see Blades at 39% and I see, what's his name? Where'd he go? Pavlovich at 33%. I think they're both going to be higher. I mean, it just, it's just too obvious. So do you have to play it? No, but you know, you, you bet you better replace those numbers. You know what I mean? Like if, if I'll put it to you another way, like if Pavlovich wins, you better have, you better have gotten there with say Cachuera. And not only that, but a Cachuera KO, like a Silva KO, a Gordon, you know, 90 point win at 6,800. You know what I mean? Like, Pavlovich wins, you need like multiple of your, I and mean, you need these big long shots to outscore him. Okay. Um, and they could, by the way. If Blades gets there at 8,800, if he wins, you, would you, well, this is actually kind of interesting. Let's, let's talk through this. You need somebody about his price to outscore him. What are the chances that anybody around his price outscores him? I, I actually would say, that if I had to fade one of these fighters between Blades and um, who would I rather fade? In other words, who's more likely to get matched by people in his price range? Here's, here's the problem. When it comes to median outcomes, like Pavlovich, when he wins like in the first or second round, he's going to score like 100. But that's his ceiling. You know what I mean? Like It's going to be somewhere between 90 and 100. And there are people that are 7,100 that could score 100. You know, Pachuera could score 100. Uh, Gordon, I don't know if he could actually score 100. You got Hestan, if things break his way, he could score 100. You have uh, Joe Yagos, he could, breaks his way, he could score 100. You have Silva, he could score 100. So, so Pavlovich's median, whatever, even a ceiling, I think that you can, that he could, um, that you can match that. But the problem is Blades' ceiling is going to be really tough for you to beat to me, okay? Because he's got five rounds of takedowns to go with his inside the distance prop. I mean, if things go his way, I mean, he could get – he could score 140 points. And, and, and the problem is, if you fade him, is that it's difficult for any of those other 9,400s to get 40, you know, 140 points. Like Montel Jackson is just never getting 140 it, be, unless he gets a knockdown, two knockdowns, and a first round KO inside of a minute, you know what I mean? You, you you're never getting out of Bobby Green unless you get a fluke first round one minute KO. Francis Marshall, you're not going to get one year forty unless I was wrong about the wrestling completely. Wrestles the crap out of him and then beats on him. You know what I mean? Like, I guess that's possible, but but it's just harder to capture capture. Blades a ceiling than it is to capture um, the Blovich's. So what do we do? You know, what do we do when we when we when we deal with uh, GPPs here? I mean, I think I've given you a lot of different underdogs you can play. I was going to say that you have to do stuff like play, you know, the, the Norman Demont fight because no one's going to play it. You know, you, maybe you have to play stuff like Brogan Walker, stuff like Ronnie Yaya, or stuff or like, you know, uh, Bobby Green at that low ownership, I imagine. But I don't think you have to. I think you could play the plays we talked about because there are just so many of them, you know? Um, Bruno Silva, 7,300. Pat Cachuera, 7,100. Yago, 7,200. Jared Gordon, I think, is going to be very low owned. Um... And I'm not saying he's going to win, but they break his way. He's good for 90, isn't he? At 6,700, isn't that enough? So, I don't know. Uh, I think it's going to be a really good card <coughs> from a DFS perspective. Good to get it right off the bat with two big key fights that you want to get a piece of and uh, firing it right to the end, which I think is going to be a great main event. Stay tuned for tomorrow. We're going to have a betting breakdown where we look at this in an entirely different way. But until then, uh, good luck, everybody.